thank you very much uh, for inviting me to share our research uh, with uh, you know clinical uh, people here. Um, and uh, my name is Teresa Sami Selvaraj. You call me Selva. I work in a department of pathology. I'm there for last 26 years from uh, 1990 onwards. I work across the street in uh, Woodruff Memorial Research Building. Um, uh, I did my postdoc in the cell admission molecules, cell admission receptors at Harvard, which is Phil Springer. Then, then I moved here and, and, and having my lab here. So when I moved here, uh, I think Dr. Kenneth Sell, he's the founding chairman of the uh, Winship Cancer Center. At the time, it's called the Winship Cancer Center, not the Cancer Institute. He was also chair of the Department of Pathology. So he called me, hey, Selva, you have all this experience in cell addition molecules and everything. Can we use your expertise in this area to develop something useful for our cancer immunotherapy, et cetera? At uh, that time, all these uh, LAC therapies, all cell line-based therapies were becoming very popular. So he asked me to develop something based on that. So, so that time the CD28 B7 story came out, how the co-stimulation is so important for stimulating the immune system. So we started with co-stimulatory molecule B7-1 and uh, then this is a, uh, you know, 20, 25 years back, not much excitement like now on immunotherapy. So, but we found a way, but the once, the, uh, you know, we were working on cell lines, then later we moved on to whole tumor cells. So I will talk something about that because I'm not going to talk all the things what we have done. I will talk about the latest developments, what we are doing, especially on breast cancer. And which this is a platform technology, what we are going to talk. Um, it can be applied to any other cancer. Um, let us go to a little bit about uh, um, cancer biology here. You know, you know, like normal cells, when they get exposed to a lot of the carcinogens, radiation, inflammation, and uh, viral infections, then you get a genetic mutations, metabolic alterations, and everything happens. Then you get a tumor cell, which start growing. That tumor cell, that time itself started expressing some of the antigens, like MUSA and the tumor antigens. These are all like a danger signal. They also uh, release uric acid uh, from the surrounding cells. So it serves as a danger signal for the immune system then immune system comes and eliminates it. They attacks it, eliminates it, get innate and adopt immunity, they, uh, you know, they eliminate, then, uh, you know, then you get a protection. This is called immunosurveillance. There's a lot of evidence for that. There is no, you know, we don't have to now emphasize the, the, the experiments which shows, yeah, immunosurveillance exists in our body. Now it's, it's beyond, it's proven beyond doubt. Okay, now then what happens here then some of the cells, some of the cancer cells, they can escape this initial immunosurveillance, okay? They start dividing there, but again, immune cells come and interact and they form a tumor microenvironment, very micrometer, it's called, it's kind of pre-neoplastic lesions kind of thing. And in this stage, uh, this can go on for years. Sometimes the cells divide, sometimes they won't divide. Uh, if they don't divide, of course, they are become resistant to immunotherapy also. Uh, the, not immunotherapy, chemotherapy, because a lot of chemotherapy drugs, uh, they target dividing cells. The cells undergo dormancy. This dormancy can stay for years. Sometimes 5, 10, 15 years later, you'll find the same tumor coming up. What happened, we removed it, you know, 10 years back from surgery, by surgery or radiation, but again comes back. So th what makes the tumor go into the dormancy state, it's still we don't know. That's a very interesting area of research. There's a lot of effort going on into that area to understand why tumor, how tumors can stay in a dormant stage, okay? Then in that time, what happens also, a lot of genomic instability and immune selection going on. Then you can see that this one color becoming multicolor as a different clones. One of the, one of the uh, important character this cancer cell acquire is resistance to apop the mutation, induced apoptosis. When normal cells get mutation in a gene, they undergo apoptosis and die. But cancer cells already acquired the resistance. So they can resist apoptosis. 
So because of the resistance, uh, resistance apoptosis, they can acquire more mutations. They can develop into different clones, which has a different mechanism of immunosuppression. So then when it develops a different mechanism of immunosuppression, they can escape from the immune system and they start growing. That's the time, you know, become a clinically detectable uh, cancer. So as I said, you know, sometimes, you know, the cancer here, what it says is that the ca cancer doesn't just come to us, you know, because something that we did yesterday. It just, you know, it's not like viral or uh, um, bacterial infection. It's just year, year long, you know, so many years it takes, you know, to develop this cancer. And uh, here, as I said, you know, different clones, they have a different mechanism of inhibition of immune system, so they can escape the immune system. They can use IDO, the galactin, or uh, VEGF. All those things, uh, they can then, the lot of peer ex expansion, they all can suppress the immune system, and the tumors uh, grow happily with the existing immune system. Immune system is intact, but tumors grow. They escape from the immune system. Uh, so the major problem, the major problem in tumor why we are not able to get a single drug which wipes out all the cancer cells. That's because we have a heterogeneity problem in it. There is a patient to patient heterogeneity. And also, if you take tumor within the one patient, then you analyze, they now all this deep sequencing, you know, uh, so become so cheap. Now they demonstrated that each section where you take biopsy, it has a different clone. Uh, so they, they can they have a different different clones in a different areas. So that is a there is a person to person heterogeneity, and within the tumor that's intra tumor heterogeneity. These two poses major problem <coughs> in lot of drug development and uh, 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 and also immunotherapy. So what happened in previously people what they, people have done they used cell lines established cell lines. You can see in all research labs we use cell lines growing cell lines from uh, either cancer patients or from uh, you know, mouse uh, tumor cell lines we use as a, a, a source. So when we have a, so much heterogeneity, when you take tumor tissue and try to grow, maybe one or two tumor clones, they grow in vitro. Most of them may not grow in, in vitro. So when some of them grow in vitro, that doesn't really represent the, all the heterogeneous population uh, uh, present in the tumor system in the, in, inside. So. What people have done, they use this as a, uh, you know, so, you know, a tool to screen drug, chemotherapy drug, and also as a vaccine source. So there are a lot of, if you go through literature, you'll see so many cell line based immunotherapy. If you take it, autologous, allogenic, everything. So, so many clinical trials went on, and all became failure, actually. I mean, it's not what you're seeing in, in mouse models, also in the in vitro here, it's not wrong, it's not, it's not wrong. It's really working good. You can really get the drug to eliminate the clones, but the remaining clones, they resist and come back as a tumor. So this is, the, so how to treat a disease like this? This is what the problem is, okay? So the, 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 now this also explains why, you know, so many uh, things failed before. So what we were doing, what we have developed a strategy is took old tumor tissue so we have, we have, we have, our focus is more on immunotherapy, not on chemotherapy. So what is old tumor tissue as an antigenic source? What we do here, we take old tumor tissue, grind them, and uh, isolate plasma membrane vesicles. This plasma membrane vesicles contain tumor associated antigens, like uh, MAC1 or HER2 and all these antigens, or they can get, a, you know, like a MHC molecules associated, you know, derived the molecules with peptides, which is derived from cytosolic proteins. So that these membrane vesicles, around 300 to 500 nanometer in size, then we take these vesicles and physically link them with immunostimulatory molecules. Then you deliver this as a vaccine. So the physical linkage here, this is called, we call protein transfer. It's a very critical uh, for that, you know, because if you don't link, you know, say you can take um, uh, tumor membrane vesicles or any uh, vaccine material, you add uh, like adjuvants, especially like what we are having here is IL-12 and B7 molecules, you mix with them and inject, they will disappear. 
the only vaccine will be there, all these molecules will go away. But what we have done is physically link them by protein transfer process. I will explain then what it means. So this differs from previous approaches in that because of the particulate nature. Because pe people have done this before. You take the old tumor tissue, grind them, use as a vaccine, add some adjuvants to that, and use as a vaccine. They, they tried this, but it didn't work very well. Because, uh, because you know, as I said, the linking the uh, molecules to the vaccine source is very critical. And uh, so that's what that, that was one of the uh, problem with the previous tumor lysate-based uh, vaccines. And here we have uh, the, un unlike lysate, the, this one is a membrane vesicle around uh, 300 nanometer. It's kind of can, it's between um, nanoparticle to microparticle in that borderline stage. And it's ideal for uh, uptake of uh, dendritic cells, okay? So what this GPI anchored molecules, you can see that what we are using is GPI anchored like D7, GPI anchored uh, IL-12. Uh, GPI anchored molecule, they're called glycosyl phosphatidylinositol anchored protein, GPI. It's a glycolipid. It attaches a protein to cell surface. So there are many protein, cell surface proteins, they have extracellular domain and the transmembrane domain, then cytoplasmic domain. Okay, that's how the cell surface proteins are. But here, there are nearly 400 proteins, naturally occurring proteins in our body. They have this GPI anchor. One interesting property of the GPI anchor is you can purify this protein uh, from any cell source. Once you purify it, you mix with any other cell source, like a, even erythrocytes. You can express this molecule within two hours. Just simple mixing and incubating at 37, this lipid chain goes incorporates and you can express new molecules. Like erythrocytes and all, you cannot express new molecules because it doesn't have a nucleus. You cannot do gene transfection. This is one of the easier way. So that, that this is the process we use uh, to introduce molecules on tumor membrane vesicles because it's already obtained from a frozen tissue. It's, it's homogenized at the ground. It's not a live cell. We can add it to the live cells also. I mean, we can express it, but it's not very stable. So, but unfortunately, most of the immunostimulatory molecules in our body, they are not GPI anchored. Either cytokines or molecules like D7, they're transmembrane proteins. But there are ways you can convert these cytokines into uh, GPI anchored cytokines by attaching a GPI anchor signal sequence from GPI anchor protein to the cytokine molecules. Now you take this hybrid DNA and transfer it in a cell line, like a show cell, then you can see the expression of these molecules on the cell surface. Now IL-2, IL-12, ENC stuff, you can express them on the cell surface and uh, they are functional. So we have done a lot of studies to demonstrate they are functionally active and I will show you some studies in vivo. So in vitro we tested they are all functionally active. So that's uh, kind of, you know, you know, a lot of, uh, I mean, people have done clinical trials before with uh, soluble cytokines. One of the problems with soluble cytokines, you inject, it goes systemically, and uh, uh, induces, I mean, triggers a lot of unwanted reactions. It's called systemic toxicity. Here, attaching this to GPA, uh, attaching to GPA anchor, making them sit on the membrane, it stays at the vaccination site. That's a key thing. So what we have done is we have converted IL-12, IL-2, and GPI, GM, uh, uh, GMCSF into GPI anchored molecules. And also, we converted post immunity molecule D7 into GPI anchored molecules. But I'll just, uh, I'm not going to talk about this, uh, studies on this one. I'll just talk about IL-2 and IL-12, what we have done, especially with the breast cancer. So we have taken a cell line called 407. It's a murine breast cancer cell line. And uh, transfected them with this. GPN. First, we want to check whether these molecules are functionally active in, in, in vivo. In vitro, it was active. Now, we want to see if we function, you know, as an anti-tumor uh, adjuvant for that thing. So, we transfected this IL-12 and IL-2 uh, IL and IL-12. You can see they are expressed on the cell surface. It also can be cleaved by PIPLC, with the enzyme which confirms it's a GPN kind of molecule. Though somehow IL-2 was a little bit resistant, we don't know the reason for that. Then we have taken this cell line, uh, which is transferred with the uh, D7 molecule or IL-12, sorry, IL-2, IL-12, 
and combination B7 IL2 or B7 IL12 and see uh, the tumor uh, growth. These are live cells challenged in a, in, a, in a mouse. You can see wild type, the tumors are growing, all of them. And if you have B7, B7 goes up and comes down. You can see that way. These are individual mice, same thing here. So these are individual mice. And uh, IL2 also there goes up, little bit comes down. Same thing here, uh, same thing in this combination. But only the combination with B7, IL12, we don't, I mean, there's only one mice developed a little bit. This we found this to be more efficient, not only in this studies, there are other studies also. We found this combination seemed to be very efficient. So we took this combination and uh, we further developed this. So uh, the another interesting thing here, not only the mice survived here, these surviving mice, what we have done, we want to see whether induced immunity, whether the tumors are not, not growing because they express the molecule or do they induce immunity. So we have taken the surviving mice and they challenge them with wild type, which is seven cells. And uh, that's called secondary challenge here. And they checked uh, for tumor growth. Uh, those mice, which are already pre-challenged with these molecules are completely resistant for wild type uh, tumor. They won't grow. What it demonstrates, we need to induce immunity. Once immunity is induced, you need this IL-2, IL-12, all these molecules for induction of immunity. Once immunity is induced, the pre-existing immunity can you know, uh, completely resist development of any new tumor cell line, tumors in, 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 with, uh, in vivo. So this kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, demonstrated, yes, we can vaccinate a mice with these molecules. We can express these molecules on the cell surface, vaccinate the mice. And uh, also another thing what we found, we see whether, whether the, the, the immunity is systemic. One side we injected just the vaccine molecules like a B7, uh, it's an IL-12 and B7 IL-12 on this side. On the other side of the mice, we injected only the wild type tumor without any of these genes here. And you can see this one, the initially it grew like I, as uh, we saw, the B7 it grew and it disappeared. And uh, then uh, all become a uh, tumor free and uh, you know, the 25 uh, to 40 days. Uh, but in the right side, in the wild type, the tumors stay there and growing, growing there. But if you have a, a B7 IL-12 in the left side, the tumor uh, suppression is pretty high. So only the 80% of the mice uh, remain tumor free here. Only, uh, you know, whereas in B7 alone, uh, you get only 20 and uh, whereas IL-12 alone, combination we get 80%. So this kind of, again, confirms that you can do induced systemic immunity not necessarily local immunity. So what we have done now, uh, we go back to the, uh, I was talking about tumor membrane vesicles. Now we have to do two things. One, we need to get purified molecule. We have to purify these molecules. I mean, these are functional molecules. Now we want to purify it and uh, we want to put it back onto the tumor membrane vesicles. What we have done is we have taken these genes specific for these molecules, transfect them in CHO cells and grow large quantities in a roller bottle in our lab, and uh, then purify by immunoassiduity chromatography, then take the purified molecule and uh, modify them by, uh, modify the TMVs by protein transfer. So how we prepare TMV, I'll give you a small uh, introduction about that. So we take the frozen tumor tissue, homogenize them, centrifuge over a, uh, ultra centrifuge over a sucrose gradient, and uh, you can see after sucrose gradient centrifugation, uh, that's a homogenate here, uh, that after centrifugation, you can see a layer, a fluffy layer here, that's a tumor membrane vesicle. All the other garbage goes to the bottom of the uh, uh, tube. This is sucrose here. So we take, we took this uh, membrane vesicles and uh, an analyzed uh, the size and uh, it's, as I said, it's around uh, 300 to 500 uh, nanometers in size and it's pretty reproducible. We can, we can make this membrane vesicles kind of we have tried many times and uh, always it comes to very reproducible. We tried both in, uh, both in uh, mouse and also in human uh, tumor tissue. So now we got both of them together. We have purified molecules and we have 
uh, TME, tumor membrane vesicles. You mix them at 37 degree for four hours. And you can see the incorporation of these two molecules here, like a B7 and IL-12 here. We did a flow state Ramsey analysis of these membrane vesicles. Uh, and both molecules are expressed on the subsurface. You can do individually or together. One good thing about this uh, protein transfer approach is the, you can control the level of expression, how much you want to add in a vaccine. So the expression uh, incorporation of this molecule depends on concentration and also time and also the temperature. Uh, so you can vary the, the concentration, the, the amount of material you're adding, so you can control how much uh, IL-12 you need, how much B7 you need. It's very easy, you know, four-hour process. It's a, a pretty simple process, so surprisingly a, a simple process. It's just an incubation, yeah, mixing two things together. Uh, so link, it's no, no chemi uh, you know, chemical linkage involved, no damage to the membrane or proteins. And the whatever is you know incorporated, it stayed pretty good at the 37 uh, in a in a culture conditions. You know, at least seven days we checked, it it was there. So we have obtained some. We want to see whether we can really prepare membrane vesicles from biopsy samples from human tumors. Uh, so David Larson and uh, Dr. Murray, you know, Murray, Dr. Murray retired now. So they gave this a lot of these samples from. Uh, renal carcinoma and melanoma, and uh, we have we have just prepared membrane vesicles from these patients' biopsies, and they add a GPI B7 molecule, and they try to stimulate in vitro because that's you know we cannot go to in vivo right right away. These are human ones, and they were able to uh, stimulate the T cell proliferation. That's incorporation. That's a proliferation. Only anomaly we found was here, uh, you know, like a one of this uh, thing. Though it's a low incorporation, we got a strong proliferation, whereas in melanoma, we got a strong incorporation, but low proliferation. This is done by a student. I told him, hey, maybe you fixed the sample. <laughs> so, but anyway, we didn't have an opportunity to go back to the same patient and to take a biopsy and test it. So what are, this is what the results we got. It's a possibility that maybe this melanoma expressing this immunoinhibitory molecule. That time we didn't know. We were not thinking about that term. Maybe that, that prevented the T cell proliferation. It, it's a very good possibility. Uh, they may be expressing a lot of PDL1 or, uh, or something like that, uh, which may be inhibiting their proliferation. But mostly, uh, they were all responsive. Um, then we went to in vivo studies. We want to test whether these membrane vaccines will work. So we have a lot of we have done a lot of studies with thymoma. Uh, that's a T, T cell lymphoma, it's a mouse model uh, that expresses a, a ovalbumin antigen. That's a ovalbumin is a foreign antigen, but still tumors grow very well in mouse because you know they induce a lot of immunosuppression, but once you put B7 molecule, they disappear, they won't grow. So, so we took that, uh, you know, we done a lot of studies with that. We, s we found it's uh, the combination of B7 and IL-12 induces strong CTL activity, eliminates the tumor. So I, that's all published a long time back, so I'm not going to talk about that. So, but we have done some more studies on breast cancer here. Let me go through that, uh, some of the recent studies. Um, what, we have, uh, what we have done is we have taken a uh, tumor, which is called B2IF2, that was transferred to human HER2. So human HER2 in mouse cell line. Now you take this, uh, breast cancer, you put it in mouse, it's supposed to induce immunity because it's a really different species, uh, uh, HER2 is going in there. But still, the tumors grow very well. As I said, tumors can induce immunosuppression, though you can induce immunity, they can induce immunosuppression, they grow very well. So that, but still, that served as a nice model antigen for us to track uh, the system. Um, so. When we vaccinated the mice with a, a, a HER2, we also made a GPI HER2 so that way we can incorporate on the uh, membrane vesicles. When we vaccinated TME alone, there is some level of uh, you know, immunity looks like, but uh, if you add GPI HER2, there is a delay in tumor development. But if you put GPI HER2 plus IL-12 and B7, we call that as a TME vaccine, there's complete protection. So the tumors 
you know, completely protected. This is a kind of prophylactic. This you can consider as a maybe node negative patient. The patient doesn't have any tumor, but you go into induced immunity, you can really completely protect any, you know, newly uh, coming, you know, growing tumors. That's what it is. So we, one thing we always do this prophylactic setting. If something doesn't work in a prophylactic setting, it won't work in a therapeutic setting. So we won't go further. So now it works so well in a prophylactic setting. Prophylactic means that you, you vaccinate, then you challenge the mice. And uh, now we went to therapeutic setting. Therapeutic setting already tumors are established. Even three days, three to seven days tumor established very well here. Then you try to treat because when you vaccinate, it takes at least another seven days for the vaccine to kick on to induce immunity. So it's almost, when a really vaccine is working, it's almost 10 days. So the tumors are very well established. So what we have done here, we have taken now uh, these mice and they um, inoculated uh, with uh, D2F2 E2 cells. On day three and day six, we gave two doses of vaccine and uh, checked for the tumor growth. As you can see that if you don't give anything, uh, like uh, just the PBS and the most of the mice will grow tumors. Uh, but if you, vac if you give two doses of vaccine at a very early stage here, we didn't, we didn't follow further, but just give two doses, and you can see that itself, you know, suppresses the, uh, the tumor growth. And it's a pretty uh, statistically significant uh, suppression. That this, this one is a HER2 specific. We have done a lot of studies. We found it mostly HER2 specific. HER2, uh, we also found a lot of antibody against that and even CTL against HER2. So I'm, I'm not showing the results here, but it's been published you know, uh, just a couple of years back in biomaterials. Um, so now, and the, the one, one theory why this membrane vaccine works, you know, we were hypothesizing it's a particulate material and uh, it can stay, because of the particular nature, it stays longer at the vaccination site. Because most of the time you inject a protein, it disappears in five, six hours from the system. You won't, you won't, you won't find it. That's why people, a lot of people try nanoparticles, nanomaterials, or, uh, or slow release materials so that way you can slowly uh, release. Same thing with adjuvants. A lot of this uh, adjuvants, they think it's a, it makes the, like an antigen depart and slowly release us. So we want to see whether our vaccine stays at the vaccination site. We took her two antigens and labeled them uh, with a red dye, like a fluorescent dye, and uh, then injected, uh, you know, incorporated into PMV, and injected the mice and followed at a different time. You can see after 48 hours, nice, uh, you know, like a, a, the dye is still there, and uh, then slowly disappears. So that's a pretty long period, you know, for a vaccine to stay in the vaccination site. That's one good thing about this PMV, human membrane vesicle based vaccine, uh, is that it can stay longer at the vaccination site. So if, you know, we haven't tested whether IL-2 and B7 is staying also, we presume that also like incorporated antigens, they will stay longer at the vaccination site. So the advantage is that there's a slow, slow release mechanism and it can attract immune cells to the vaccination site or it can be taken up well by the dendritic cells and taken to the lymph nodes. So then we, this is a HER2 model. Then we went to another model. Uh, it's a triple negative breast cancer model. One, we thought our, our therapy, our technology, what we are developing is very appropriate for triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancer is one which lacks ER, PR, and HER2 antigens. So there is no ER target, you cannot use ER targeted therapy or PR targeted therapy or HER2 targeted therapy. So around 20 to 30 percent of the breast cancer is called triple negative breast cancer. So there is no target antigen, but target antigen is there, but it varies patient to patient. So you cannot take a, a, a breast cancer patient, say it's a triple negative, yeah, this is the target antigen. Maybe the target antigen is there, but it's not, uh, it's not same in you know, every patient. So we thought when a, such a high heterogeneity, that tumor is a right, uh, you know, thing. Unfortunately, there's only one uh, mouse model available for that. It's called 41. Uh, that is that mouse model uh, is that uh, 41 uh, is a is a sister cell line of 47, but it's highly metastatic. Highly metastatic. What I mean is highly metastatic. It's very aggressive. 
this one here, we give 10,000 cells. 10,000 cells in a breast pack pack. You kill a mice in 40 to 50 days by metaprotect. Whereas in other system, we have to inject 200,000 to a million cell. Then it takes a month to see tumor development. But here, a ten, just near 10,000 cells can kill a mice in a 40 days. So it's extremely aggressive model. So we took this model and uh, uh, they tested our vaccine here and see whether it works. And also this model has been reported. It's completely immune checkpoint uh, resistant model. PD-1, PTLA-4 doesn't work in this model. So we thought, okay, let us see whether our, our vaccine works. But when we vaccinated, our vaccine didn't work that well here. You can see that this is unvaccinated and vaccinated. So what do we do? Vaccinate, then boost, then challenge arthroscopically. And then we added antibody therapy, that is PTLA-4 antibody therapy here. You can see by TM vaccine alone, you know, there is some front, but it's, it didn't work. Uh, that's a metastatic clones. What we do is we take, uh, we euthanize the mice and we take the lung and uh, grow the uh, colonies from there, you know, lung colonies, because that's much more sensitive than doing crystal chemistry. This is a, even a single cell, you know, you have, you have few cells sitting there, it will grow as a colony. So when we did that, this, but when we come, when we had injected uh, anti-CTLA monoclonal antibody, it was not responsive. This is, the, this is exactly what is reported in the literature. So it doesn't respond to CTLA-4 therapy. But when we combine the both, you can see a, a dramatic decrease in uh, metastasis to lung. So there is a, this combination uh, seems to be working here. That's why that's what the lung uh, it, uh, look, you can see them in a PDS, untreated mice, there's so many uh, um, nodules, you know, like metastatic nodules here. Whereas when you treat with this, uh, our vaccine plus CTLA-4, there is just, you know, not much. There's maybe one or two here, uh, metastatic nod nodules. Both, oh, the vaccine, we, vaccine means we treat with, with IL-12 and B7. So we, when we don't put vaccine, we put just TMV, it is not like that. So when we put TM vaccine, we modify the TMV to express IL-12 and the B7 molecule. Yes. So here, we want to check whether it is mediated really by immune system, this protection. What we have done is we vaccinated, boosted, then we deplete either, uh, deplete either CD4 and CD8 cells and see then after a deplete, depletion, we challenge the mice with the tumor and see which, you know, where you see, uh, you know, decrease in metastatic clones. You can see that, you know, depleting, I mean, the vaccine you brings down the number three, that's a, a vaccine, that, that, that's a GPI SM, TMV, plus CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody. You, get, you have a very good reduction. And whereas depleting CD4, there is no effect. If you deplete CD8 cells, well, a lot of metastasis. Not only the metastasis is much more than what you see in the control group. What it shows is even naturally also, it is CD8 is protecting to a certain level. So our vaccine really induces more CD8 immediate immunity, we can get a better protection. This is the, this is the real thing. You know, we want to look at the clinical scenario. What happens? That one all, those those studies we vaccinate and challenge, vaccinate and challenge. But when patient comes to the hospital, they come with the tumor, and uh, then what uh, what people do is usually they do uh, either chemotherapy or do surgery. So what we have done is here we challenge the mice uh, with 41 cells in the breast pack, pack, breast pack pack. Then after 10 days, uh, we surgically remove the tumor and they stitch, stitch it back or they put a glue and they stitch the skins back. It's a subcutaneous tumor in a press back pack. But that time itself metastasis is very well established in 10 days, okay? Then after that we give a TME vaccine, two doses. And in the meantime, we also give the CTLA-4 therapy here, four, four doses of CTLA-4 therapy. And uh, we waited to see whether how long these mice survive. As you can see, only group 
which really survived long, is the combination of our vaccine plus CTLA-4. So even CTLA-4 doesn't protect this alone. So that I think CTLA-4 has already, uh, you know, it didn't work in a human uh, clinical trials also. It's also uh, recapitulated, uh, you know, we, we are able to reproduce that here too. And uh, very interesting thing is that this mice live longer. And not only that, now I do, I'm not showing the results. I, we found uh, some of the mice, the surviving mice, uh, actually uh, my uh, fellow in my lab, uh, Rami, he challenged them with, uh, again, with wild type tum uh, tumor. The, most of the mice are protected in that. So that means it induces protective immunity. So how this uh, membrane vaccine induces protective immunity? That's what uh, our, uh, our goal is to see. We have done many studies, so I, I just summarize here, like CTL studies and all those things. The TMV vaccine, what we see here, the TMV vaccine acts on NK7, because it has a CD20, sorry, B7 molecule, it has IL-12. B7 has a receptor on NK cells and also it has a receptor on mast cells, CD28. They can trigger interferon gamma and TNF alpha. Uh, the same thing, TME vaccine has IL-12. IL-12 has a receptor on dendritic cells. So now this uh, vaccine can activate this, these cells around that uh, in the, at the vaccination site and also they release interferon gamma and TNF alpha. That can act on dendritic cells and also they can directly act on uh, DCs here uh, and the DCs take up and process and present to CD8 cells. Then CD8 cells expand. That CD8 cells now go and act on the tumor and uh, make the tumor disappear. So here, what we are using is, as I said, the tumor membrane vesicle prepares from old tumor tissue, which has all different antigenic components, which is exposed to different clones. So the, uh, this, is a, this is the mechanism that we are moving forward with. And uh, so the so recently, you know, we know we saw there's a may, you know like a CTLA-4 therapy, PD-1 therapy, all approved, but they work in 70 percent of the uh, patients. You know, I say, I mean, work in 20 to 30 percent. 70 percent of the patients don't respond very well. So we think one of the mechanism could be one of the mechanism. There are many many mechanisms, as I said. Cancer is so heterogeneous. One of the mechanism could be uh, due to lack of pre-existing anti-tumor immune response. So what we are, why you need a pre-existing anti-tumor response? If you look at the, the way this immune checkpoint work, like uh, dendritic cells, like antigen-presenting cells, they take up tumor antigen secreted by the tumor or, or uh, derived from the tumor, uh, dead, tu uh, dead cells or whatever it is. They take it and the process and the present to the uh, T cell. Then T cell receives two signal like a one go up B71 and CD28, and uh, signal one through T cell receptor and MHC molecule, then they proliferate and uh, they undergo expansion. Then they can go and kill the tumor. That's a normal process. And what happens is here, once the T cells get activated, then you get a CTLA-4 coming up. Then B7 uh, can bind, I mean, this leads to inhibition of the uh, signal and you don't have an expansion. That's one checkpoint here. Other checkpoint here, the tumors can express PDL1. The interesting thing is the, mo the, the model we use, POTI1 model, they expresses PDL1, but doesn't respond to PD1 therapy. It's very similar uh, you know, to the 70% of the population uh, we are talking about here. And here, then you have a PDL1 expression. Uh, when tumors express PDL1, the, uh, the activated T cells express PD1, you, do, you don't get a killing. So you get another checkpoint here in both checkpoints. What I'm trying to say here is, in order for the checkpoints to work, we need to have a T cell immunity. T cell immunity is induced, then it's not able to kill the tumor. Now you put the checkpoint, well, it releases the break, it kills. But when you don't have a T cell immunity, that's where the problem is. So what we are trying to say, say here is, we want to really use a vaccine as a source and vaccinate these patients and make them responsive, like what we have done with the POTI1 model here. Make them responsive to uh, uh, in this uh, checkpoint inhibitor. So this is one approach what we think uh, can be taken. And uh, 
one good thing with our approach is we can take old tumor tissue and make a vaccine which can incorporate all the new antigens, mutated antigens, uh, or uh, uh, just overexpressed antigens for a particular tumor. So that's how our vaccine, uh, our vaccine approach. That uh, so there is a it's, a it's a very promising to go, uh, you know, take this uh, method. Of so in summary, uh, what we, are, we have demonstrated, cytokines can be mobilized on PNV and used as a vaccine, an adjuvant to induce immunity. Uh, we found it induces strong immunity in a thymoma model, and I will show up here and also in HER2 breast cancer model. Um, and also this PME vaccine can induce potent anti-tumor immunity in a checkpoint resistant model. So it can synergize uh, to induce uh, strong anti-tumor immunity with the CTLA-4 induce, induce uh, the other studies with PD-1 is on the progress. We are still working on the PD-1 and see whether our can uh, synergize with PD-1 also and also in the combination with PD-1 and uh, CTLA-4. And uh, what are the advantages of our, uh, our PME-based personalized therapeutic vaccine? So one advantage here is you don't need a live cell. So previously people would try to do autologous therapy, they try to develop cell lines in the patient. It's very difficult to grow cells in in vitro, especially breast cancer, 90% of the time it won't grow. I think uh, in uh, melanoma, 50% of the time it won't grow. So a lot of previous therapies have been done with the melanomas, not with other, other tumors. So here, we don't need to establish any cell lines. Or uh, there is no need to in vitro manipulation of patients' immune cells, like what uh, like Gembrion Corporation is doing, take dendritic cells, pulse them with the uh, antigen prevalence therapy, and put it back into the patients. It's a it's laborious process, and you're still using only one antigen there. So. We don't need to worry about that. So cell membranes can be frozen in aliquot for booster doses. We don't have any foreign materials like viral vectors are involved in this. And uh, so this is a patients uh, in the vaccines, they contain antigenic signature of each patient, personalized. So personalized therapy, you need to do very fast. Ours is in the whole process, uh, I'll, I'll show you, uh, it takes only you know five to six days. And membrane-bound cytokines may allow direct targeting tumor antigens to the APCs. And also the physical linkage and the local delivery of cytokines, tumor membrane vesicles, uh, that will eliminate problems that occur with uh, systemic cytokine administration. IL-12 was approved by FDA before, like uh, maybe 20 years back for approval human use, because they, they saw strong data in mouse. The FDA approved it. When they started clinical trial, people started dying. So they put a hold on that, that never got approved again. Now, this is another way to use IL-12 is uh, to attach to membrane vesicle itself and we don't need to inject it clinically. And uh, so we have recently received a uh, R01 grant to continue on these studies, what we on uh, breast cancer. And mostly these are translational studies we are trying to do. Uh, we are taking uh, like a patient's, uh, because uh, as I said, you know, in breast cancer, especially triple negative breast cancer, there is only one model available. Now we want to test more models. We want to really develop more models using humanized mice, taking patients' tumor tissue directly, uh, you know, in putting into the uh, humanized mice and using our vaccine and see whether it works. And also we want to check whether standard of care drug, what people clinically using affects our immunotherapy or enhances our immunotherapy. So that is very critical in selecting patients. So it's kind of a lot of translational studies we have proposed and uh, we got funding for that. And also we got uh, a seed money to start a program on lung cancer. Uh, we already started on that one. We are, we are working on the lung cancer uh, for the Lindsay Cancer Center. And we also, uh, we have some studies done with melanoma. It, it, is, uh, it is working good, but we have to do more studies on that. And so based on all these things, this is what we are envisioning, okay? So tumors, we get the tumors from the patient. And uh, pathologist grades and freezes tumor and uh, ships to our lab, shipping to our lab as a frozen tissue. And uh, we take the tumor tissue and homogenize them and produce TMV. And uh, that TMV we can 
uh, immediately modified then by protein transfer. We said the two molecules we used here is a GPI B7, GPI L12. Actually, we can add more molecules like GPI, GM, KSF, or whatever uh, other cytokines we need. Later, we need to add that. Right now, we see, at least in breast cancer, these two molecules are doing pretty good. So we want to uh, mix with them and do the protein transfer. Then we have the modified TMV. That is the vaccine for, for us. And uh, take that one, do the quality control testing, uh, and uh, then store it. This is, uh, at least we found the vaccine can be stored very well. In, you know, that's one good thing about this. Then ship it back to the, uh, you know, uh, the clinic to do intradermal injection. So that, this is what the whole, uh, the concept we are working towards, uh, to taking this, uh, you know, whatever we are done in the lab to clinics. Uh, we hope to be in clinical trials at least in one or two years. We have only the bottleneck here, bottleneck here is, see the whole process of, uh, you know, getting tissue and acquiring, modifying and all those things. If you have this GPA molecules available, if this molecules are, this is the bottleneck here. If you have this molecules available, the process is just four hours. So we can prepare quality control and testing, everything done, we can uh, send it back to the clinic within five to seven days. That, that fast we can do it because a lot of times the preparation of the vaccine is very critical, the time to prepare. Previously, you know, like uh, cell lines, people took six months to develop a, you know, a, a vaccine because you have to develop in vitro and uh, transfect and all those things was a, was a big problem. And so that's one thing we are seeing, okay? So, so these are the people who contributed, you know, from early days, as I said, that's Kenneth Sell, who was our, he's a founding uh, uh, chair of this uh, Vincent Cancer Institute. He kind of pulled me into the, this uh, uh, cancer, uh, cancer immunotherapy. I was working on this cell adhesion molecules before. And uh, actually, initially, Doug Murray and uh, David Lawson gave us a lot of this uh, tumor biopsy samples for us to analyze whether we can prepare TMB from them and use it uh, to stimulate T cells. And a lot of work, uh, mouse work has been done by Ashley, Erica, Jaina, uh, who are uh, graduate students in my lab. And uh, Rami is currently uh, working in my lab with uh, uh, lung cancer and also some of the uh, PD-1 uh, and uh, CTLA-4 uh, stuff. Um, and uh, Ash, uh, she's working on uh, lung cancer. And the NIH collaborators, uh, Kirti, uh, Bill Lee, uh, and uh, Lily Yang, and Dr. William Wood, they are all consultant collaborators. Here I want to specifically mention William Wood was responsible for me to starting the program on, uh, on breast cancer here. So he thought that our vaccine approach will work very well in uh, breast cancer because of the lot of membrane antigens lot of uh, tumor associated antigens are membrane antigens in breast cancer, like MUC1, um, SN antigen, and also uh, HER2. Uh, so there are a lot of antigens are uh, membrane antigens. And also we have a collaboration with this uh, NIH grant was uh, in, a, in a collaboration with uh, Medical Therapeutic uh, Corporation, uh, which uh, I am also a co-founder of, uh, founder of this company, uh, and uh, which uses this technology here. That's my disclaimer. So that's about it. Do you have any questions? Anyway. 